Sir, and welcome. This is a frightening piece of news, which of course has been around for a while. By 2030, a billion Indians will be in the workforce. A majority of that workforce will be obsolete even before they start working. There's a fundamental challenge ahead for the Indian economy and the polity as it happens, which is jobs. More than 12 million people are coming into the workforce every year, about, and a lot of them will not get jobs unless there is sufficient economic growth and sufficient uh, momentum in the economy. We've been addressing this issue from various points of view. We've already had one conversation with Subir Gokarn uh, at the Brookings Institute, also former Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, let's now go on to the second part where we try and understand what could be the policy prescriptions for uh, some of the challenges that are arising because of the lack of jobs and of course what could happen if we don't address the issues uh, raised. So Subir joins us once again uh, shortly to be joining us will be Ashok Bhattacharya, editor of the Business Standard newspaper as well. And that's where the original column from uh, Subir appeared just yesterday. Subir, thank you very much for uh, speaking with us once again. So we've outlined the problem, which is uh, as dire as it gets. Uh, it's also obviously become a uh, fairly heightened political issue considering, I mean, or given that many people have started saying that they see uh, that the uh, that the bjp for instance may have all the uh, magic solutions to solve the jobs problems by creating the growth and so on uh, the congress of course has its own solutions uh, which is uh, which is in some ways have been playing out in the last few years so uh, what are the key challenges as you see ahead from a policy uh, prescription and delivery point of view at this point well i think uh, can, can am, I, am i audible can you hear me absolutely yeah okay so I think I've, we've got to accept, and this was uh, a key point in my in my article. Uh, we've got to accept the fact that, you know, the way technology is moving uh, is essentially labor displacing. Mm -hmm. That is, as we go forward in time, that old model of putting lots of people to work in big factories producing shirts or shoes or or you know iPads or whatever, that model is completely. Uh, you know, in itself, uh, essentially now history. Uh, the future for factories lies in essentially automation, robots, very, very highly integrated uh, technological processes where the average worker is going to have skill levels, training levels, and also obsolescence rates. I, I'm, I'm particularly emphatic on obsolescence rates. That is, you, you people will be displaced very fast. Uh, three years, five years, and then you know you're 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 not uh, somebody's going to come and uh, you know do the job better right. because he's better trained or whatever. So we should not be looking at the way China did things or before that the way Korea or Taiwan or Malaysia or, or Thailand did things because they were the beneficiaries of an essentially relatively labor-intensive kind of uh, regime, kind of environment, and they were able to put large numbers of people to work in producing these things. I think we have to worry about whether that model is replicable. If that doesn't happen, then obviously labor is always going to be used. Uh, there's always going to be demand for labor. We have to figure out where, uh, what kinds of activities are labor going to be used in most? Uh, how do we ensure that our growth path, our growth strategy emphasizes those activities? Uh, which is then the only way in which you're going to put uh, people, more right. people to work. Uh, and the, 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 the second point is that, you know, even in those activities, people are going to lose, uh, become de-skilled very quickly, three years, five years, seven years. So you have to have, and this is a point I was trying to make in the previous one, but I wasn't very audible. Uh, our strategy for training is focused on early career, entry-level workers. Mm. That is what Dilip Chinna was talking about the other day. Mm. But uh, we need to have a program a strategy which allows for mid-career and repeated mid-career uh, reskilling uh, if you're going to keep people at work for 35, 40 years of their lives. Uh, you know, both of these are integral, critical elements of the strategy. And there are many more which you can talk about, but those are the two that I want to right. put on so, the table first. Subir, uh, you know, uh, the question and concern is that the policies that we are talking about today as a response to the jobs problem that we have, including the national manufacturing policy and so on, are still to catch up with the problem that there is or that we are facing today. Uh, what you're saying is in some ways, uh, if I've understood you correctly, is that even that solution which is yet to even catch up uh, with the problem is not the right one and we should be thinking afresh. I, I think we are we are fighting uh, tomorrow's battle with you know the instruments and the thinking of uh, several decades ago. Okay. Uh, we we have to we have to close that gap. 
Okay, and and how do we close that gap then? Because if I mean, I, you know, whether it's the political dispensation, the economic dispensation, the thought dispensation, uh, the ca the capability of the economy and the entrepreneurship and the businesses within it, all of it is really geared for a, only one or two solutions. Assuming, of course, the rest of the uh, uh, system or the ecosystem is willing to support it. Right. I think you know it's it's obviously uh, a problem that we've that has been building up for many decades now. Uh, in the previous regime, pre-1991 regime, uh, the government stepped in and became essentially the employer of last resort. So where you know you had you had issues with uh, people not getting jobs, the government recruited them, whether in directly into government or the public sector, banks, uh, public enterprises, whatever. That model broke down in the mid 90s, of course, after liberalisation began and you know the whole rethinking of what the state was going to do and or, or not do. Uh, now, you know, I, I don't think we can go back to that employer of the last resort model again. The government simply cannot afford it. Uh, society cannot afford it. But at the same time, you've got to think in terms of, as I said, uh, you know, what are the kinds of activities which will actually put the kind of people we have. You know, we have, we, we have people, they, they have certain levels of skills. Even if you're going to train young uh, kids, mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to to catch up. So right now there is this sort of low skill manual kind of uh, worker profile that is in plenty, and that means construction. That means you know getting this whole infrastructure game back into play. Uh, the highways program I thought was a phenomenal combination of both creating infrastructure and putting people to work. Not just putting them to work, but putting them to work in places where they lived because that's where the roads were being built. So you didn't have to move people long distances to get them to work. And those right. kinds of you know, uh, they're old solutions. They've been tried before in other countries, but I think they have some relevance today. They're not going to solve the problem entirely, yeah. but that's when you have a problem of this magnitude, you have to break it up as we you know the business management 101. You break down your problem into tangible, into tractable parts, and then you start to address each part. I think that is how we want to approach this. This is not going to be the result of a grand strategy. Uh, this is going to be a bunch of different initiatives addressing different needs different segments of the population, which all add up to a relatively effective uh, approach. So I think that's the approach, we've, that's the philosophy that we've got to bring into this. Right. So let me come back to the manufacturing part, Subir. So uh, China too, I mean, since that's the only other scale example one can use in contrast, uh, China too faced similar situations of, uh, you know, a large population, uh, getting them gainfully employed and also uh, it had the twin objective of creating all this infrastructure to support uh, supported as well as to sort of ensure economic growth. Now, the uh, the hundreds of millions of people who have been involved uh, in the workforce in China have been doing both. Uh, I'm assuming building uh, the highways, the railway lines, uh, all the other big infrastructure, as well as being involved in the manufacturing. Uh, the manufacturing is what provided the the, the large part of the impetus, uh, particularly from export growth. The maybe the domestic uh, part of the uh, uh, of the infrastructure creation, investment, and so on. To care of domestic consumption, so don't you need both? Is really my question. Yeah, I think so. I think we we have to have both, but also I think we have to remember, and this is again the, my point about obsolescence, that the Chinese model, the Chinese growth trajectory of 30 years from the late 70s till uh, you know the early part of this decade uh, or uh, last decade, was in it was it, it evolved in an environment where this sort of very low cost labor. Uh, was extremely competitive uh, in producing many things that uh, uh, that uh, customers wanted. Right. Uh, hello, am I still on? Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, there's some fade in the light here. Mm. Uh, now, you know, when you look at the Chinese model itself, they've obviously run into some sort of uh, hurdles because their wage costs have gone up, so they cannot continue along the same path. They've got to think of different ways of doing things. So, is that two, an opportunity then? It is. It is an opportunity. But in the meantime, mm. there have been so many developments technologically mm. uh, that, you know, just find 30 years, 40 years later, trying to replicate the Chinese model by putting large numbers of unskilled, relatively unskilled workers into factories. I don't think that's going to happen. So we're in a different environment, both technologically and in terms of market conditions. Uh, there's a lot more automation out there. Robotics have become very cheap. Uh, you know, you, we keep hearing about 3D printers. And if you look at the pace at which the 3D printing technology has evolved, 
it's starting to become like uh, you know very very low cost automated production for many things right uh, that wasn't the case 30 40 years ago you didn't have an, you didn't have that kind of competition 30 40 years ago so now you're not just competing against other countries you're competing against technological advancement in the uh, advanced economies where your main export markets lie so you you got to take that into account as well and i think you know, so it's a different scale of challenge right. entirely. So That's these what are I'm the, saying. Right. So these are the uh, these are the changes on ground as you see them. So how do you? Uh, what's the policy architecture that is needed to address it? I mean, how do the the incoming finance minister, commerce minister, uh, and all the other various industry ministers sit down and approach this? Because we're I'm assuming that this takes that level of uh, focus and dedication. Well, I, I think, yes, absolutely, it should be an employment mission or a jobs mission, I think is the best way to describe it. It cannot be the responsibility of one ministry or a small set of uh, government agencies. Uh, it requires complete and total uh, coordination and, 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 you know, buy-in from, from uh, the various uh, interests. Now, I think, as I said, it's, this is not a you know, magic wand kind of problem where you do one thing and everything falls into place. Every aspect of it needs to be addressed based on the need, based on the resources. So the first, the macro issue certainly is that you've got to be growing as fast as possible. Without that, you're not going to be able to you know, address the problem at any level, mm -hmm. to any extent. Once you do that, then is your growth strategy, is your growth path leading you? veering you towards the more labor intensive uh, activities whatever they may be hmm. this construction infrastructure is certainly one part of it then there are the textiles and other things we we completely lost the uh, the the game in electronics which you know china has had such a, a huge right. advantage in uh, you know why shouldn't we be assembling the ipads uh, in in india hmm. you, know, you need a certain type of you don't need high skill for that you need a certain type of uh, training and and discipline don't see why we can't do it we've done very well with automobiles although there are some recent signs of uh, labor uh, unrest in that industry but that's you know we've reached that point of of being a global player in the automotive sector i don't see why that can't be replicated in other sectors where there's a combination of relatively high skill and mass uh, production mass employment and those learn from these these experiences but bottom line our training philosophy has to change. We have to be looking at uh, at uh, not only training at the entry level, uh, but also continuing to provide uh, right. reskilling opportunities as we go along. That's a huge new kind of dimension to the employment issue, which we have to address. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, we haven't even uh, you know started to talk about that because we're still talking about the entry level through the NSD. So those are all important, no question, and they're mm -hmm. critical, but they're not enough. Right. And, and the, as you say, this is the time to leapfrog. Uh, some questions coming in, Subir. Uh, Kunal Saikya asks, uh, what are the short and long term strategies needed to revive the manufacturing sector? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> we have uh, been in uh, a situation of refusing to face the reality uh, as to why manufacturing has been such a laggard. Uh, you know, every country that uh, we, we compare ourselves with uh, has grown on the back of manufacturing being the leading the engine mm -hmm. uh, and we did now i think that three specific issues that we need to address one is that uh, large scale manufacturing in the kind of labor uh, uh, the job security regulation environment that we have will not happen it's very clear and we have some large factories but by and large our manufacturing is is pushed into the informal sector which is very small scale stay below the radar basically is the is the strategy uh, you know we we tried this in 1999 uh, the new textile policy right uh, where we we scrapped the concept of a reservation for small industry which we had earlier uh, in the in the case of men's garments so you could build very large factories uh, to produce you know million white uh, shirts uh, which is what china does uh, but we didn't go to take the next step, which was to exempt these factories from the uh, imposition, the burdens of the job security regulation. Hmm. So, you know, nobody had an incentive to build those factories because you took away one constraint, but you kept the other one in place. So the number of binding constraints from the labor market side, I think, which you have to address. Second is, of course, our infrastructure is horrendous. Our infrastructure costs, the cost that is imposed on our producers because of bad infrastructure, 
takes our competitiveness away completely on most manufactured goods. Uh, even a simple thing like uh, this, a cost to move from a factory to the port uh, is, is prohibitive. Uh, that's something which has been plaguing us for uh, for many, many years. And I think, you know, unless we get to grips right. with that, manufacturing will take off. The third is the fiscal situation. Hmm. Uh, industry has been disproportionately uh, imposed, uh, disproportionately taxed. That has been corrected to some extent by the imposition of service tax. But when we get to the GST, uh, which is essentially a tax which is completely activity neutral, doesn't matter what you do, you will be taxed according to the surplus you generate. That is, I think, a very, very important basis for uh, for reducing the comparative disadvantage that the fiscal system has placed on manufacturing. I think these are three absolutely necessary conditions. Of course, beyond that, you know, technology and, and you know, clusters and all of those things. But I think those will flow once there is a basic set of incentives in favor of manufacturing. Right. So, uh, question linked to that, uh, uh, Subir Rajeshri asked, are we meant to be a manufacturing economy? Shouldn't we focus on more services? If you see the situation in America, uh, they focus more on innovation while the manufacturing gets uh, done in China. A very, very interesting question because we don't have a model uh, historically, that tells us that you can you can bypass manufacturing at these levels of per capita income. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the U.S. is moving to services, but they're you know whatever 30 times or whatever the per capita income, uh, and most of these transitions from manufacturing to services have happened at much higher levels of per capita income than we are at now. So if you want to look at historical precedents, we cannot escape. The, the role, uh, we cannot bypass or dismiss the role of manufacturing uh, in taking us from low income to middle or higher upper middle income. Now, the question is, are we in a different environment? And perhaps we are to some extent, because uh, we have used the opportunity provided by an opening up of international trade and services. I mean, we are the, really the first significant exporters of services from the emerging markets group. Right. Uh, no. Other service exported essentially tourism. Nobody has exported the kind of services, we, and we've actually been pioneers in that. So we did that. We used our resources. We used the opportunity. We used whatever uh, you know technological space we had, and so on. It did a phen phenomenal job of it. Now, problem is that you know if you don't have a diploma or a or a degree in in software engineering or, or whatever it is, soft, in computer engineering or computer science. Your access to these activities is, is restricted. Hmm. Obviously, call centers, BPOs, and so on uh, take you in with a uh, with a not such a high technical qualification. But you need to be speaking English if you want to work in a call center. I mean, they train you for that, but not everybody gets trained. So when it comes to creating access to employment to the to very large numbers of people. We have to have channels, we have to have job opportunities which are not so restrictive in nature. I think that's why we have been looking at manufacturing as a huge necessity in terms of complementing the very, uh, very, very positive record, right. uh, the very impressive record of, this, of the services sector. So that's limited. It's not going to cover the whole population. Right. So, uh, more questions, uh, uh, Subir. Uh, Shruti again asks, uh, everyone knows the task is mammoth, but the way the government moves, not sure how 12 million jobs can get created in a jiffy. How does the private sector and make this work, uh, step in and make this work? I think the private sector is the ultimate creator of the jobs. But what the government needs to do is to ensure that there is a facilitation of job creation. And I come back to the points I made earlier which is one we have to be growing as fast as possible. That's when jobs are being created. We know this from our own experience that employment boomed when, when uh, growth was high. Two, we've got to be veering. And I'm not saying you know we should be using sort of a hard kind of a very sophisticated or rigorous industrial policy kind of framework. But we've got to be ensuring that the kind of growth that's happening, uh, the, the sectors that are driving that growth, must have a high level of labor intensity. Uh, and this is why you know infrastructure and so on become so important because not only do they uh, do they create the capacity for future growth, but they also are very very powerful in generating jobs uh, at the present time. So is our growth basket is is our are our growth drivers generally veering towards the labor intensive uh, end of the spectrum? I think that's the second point. Now, what do you need to do there? You need to create ensure that there is no deterrent to private capital, private uh, business or uh, commerce to, uh, to
to to their hiring people and that's what we've done we've we've created deterrence through the industry right. disputes act and other other factories uh, regulations we've created deterrence people to hire so they don't want to hire workers they they either use machinery or they find a, a back door through contract and you know subcontracting and so on which actually doesn't really work to anyone's advantage of course people get jobs but they don't have protection so i think that's the balancing act the reality is that in 2000 in 1999 i believe maybe it is 2000 uh, so yashwant sinha as finance minister proposed that they would uh, the government should ra- raise the ceiling the exemption ceiling uh, for uh, firing workers without uh, permission hmm. uh, there was enormous pushback on that from a bunch of interests including labor unions who actually have a very small membership when you look at it but they have enormous disproportionate political clout so that fell by the wayside we find in state governments and there's a number of research studies that uh, validate this that a number of states have found bypass strategies they have right. found ways to allow employers to not to be sort of completely bowed down by these uh, job state seeking labor laws yeah. hmm. those those states seem to be uh, finding it much easier to attract investment in manufacturing so let's learn from this experience the services sector doesn't have these rec- restrictions it has grown enormously in terms of employment so i think rather than worrying about protecting the few who have jobs we should be focused on encouraging people to hire the many who don't i think that's the fundamental uh, facilitation role that the government has to play and once that happens then the private sector will obviously have an incentive to hire low cost workers right uh, so, because it's cheaper to hire these workers than it is to invest in machinery in many activities right so subir so uh, a bit of a chicken and egg question so if I, we were to take a step back now you said that growth is a precondition for this uh, or a lot of this happening which is uh, us hitting the uh, the jobs uh, absorption target or is that something that will uh, uh, lead to good uh, higher growth or higher growth numbers I think it's uh, it's it's exactly that it's a chicken and egg uh, you know I think when we go back to our high growth phase 2003 to 2008 we have to remember that a major trigger for that although it was not the only causal factor the number of things came together but the major trigger a major trigger for that is the highways program which actually put a lot of government money into building meaningful infrastructure mm-hmm. and it took, it brought a lot of people to into work and as i said importantly it didn't have to they didn't have to move from wherever they were to mumbai or delhi or chennai or uh, kolkata or, or uh, bengaluru they the jobs came to them uh, that's what something like a roads or highways program does that's for big nation wide network uh, development so if you've got highway we haven't completed the program there's a whole rail thing going on that we talked about we should be the corridors for example will be very very important job generators i think it's that's the backbone that's the sort of the uh, scaffolding on which this whole program or the, this whole right. uh, employment mission is going to, to take off so it it starts the process it 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 breaks the vicious circle and then there's a self sustaining kind of momentum that generates that that develops i think that's the, that's the way to see this right uh, how are you broadly uh, seeing the preconditions to growth then uh, at this point of time you know given that uh, we've had a slow phase of growth for the last few years uh kicking uh, it back to higher levels which in turn will create the job ab- creation or the absorption is not going to be simple w- what's even assuming things start coming back on track almost magically uh what's the kind of time frame that you see well i think uh, we need to focus uh on three absolutely critical stress points right now uh, without which we're not going to get growth back to anywhere where we anywhere close to our aspiration uh the first is food uh, we we are having huge problems in agriculture and because of our persistent food inflation problem the reserve bank has essentially been taken out of the game as far as growth goes uh either they stay where they are and say look you know inflation has to be managed so we have to keep interest rates high or they take a huge punt uh, and say look let's lower interest rates and try and stimulate growth but the risks of inflation just getting out of control are very high in that scenario so that's a difficult judgment and so far i think they made the right judgment in staying focused on inflation control but that takes out of the growth game on infrastructure we we thought we had uh, you know solved the puzzle we got the ppp model into place uh, and 5 years 7 years later we find that that model really has not worked at all 
there are enormous numbers of projects that are under financial stress. The companies that are implementing them are themselves under financial stress. So how do we get more money into infrastructure? How do we get these projects completed uh, so that they can contribute to, to economic activity? And that's the problem that the government has to solve. And this may involve uh, some more government money coming in. Now, where do you get that from is, is the challenge that they have to face. But I think the PPP structure is now uh, certainly being uh, under serious question. And we need to redesign it in whatever way we can. I don't have a solution here, but you know these are issues that I'm thinking about right. and in trying to, to get a fix on. And the third one is exactly what I've been talking about, uh, you know, two days ago and today, is the jobs. You know, if it, if we've had growth at nine percent a year for five years, and the number of jobs created were far less than any other country of comparable sort of uh, you know uh, resource resources and trajectories would have. And you've got to look at what is stopping people from hiring. And I think it comes back to the issues we've been talking about a little before, which is that there are deterrents, there are barriers to the private sector hiring workers. They don't want to hire workers. And we've got to get rid of those barriers, because if, they, if we don't get rid of them, the whole point of growth, uh, translating into welfare, translating into better standards of living, is, is simply going to be missed. So let's not stand in the way of people hiring workers, employers hiring workers. That's the fundamental driver of economic growth, of economic development. Right, Subhi. So that's your clear message coming through that uh, uh, the policy uh, framework needs to uh, make it easy for uh, enterprises to create jobs, to hire people and of course uh, fire them or more uh, appropriately create a flexible uh, labor environment and that's a very critical uh, point. Right. So, Subhi, uh, last question. Uh, you know, uh, given where things are today, and uh, given where we stand again on the on the on the cusp of political change, and therefore all the economic imperatives that will soon come back to the table, uh, are you at this point feeling optimistic, or are you still concerned about what lies ahead? I uh, I'm optimistic because I think the uh, the the only situation which the system makes decisive change, uh, takes new initiatives uh, that typically result in positive outcomes is under the kind of pressure that the economy is today. And I, I, I'm, that, for that reason, I compare today with 1991. Uh, things are under enormous stress. There is a new government in the offing. Uh, the pressure to, to act dramatically and decisively is very much on that government, and I hope that they will take, take it. I'm sort of pessimistic because I think apart from decisive action, uh, you also need to be thinking uh, about the problems in appropriate ways. And I'm not sure that our policy blueprint for employment has really captured uh, fully uh, the new realities that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, govern, that dictate the, the whole employment, productivity, technology nexus. And I think we have to start thinking uh, somewhat differently on how we handle right. these issues, both in the immediate future and over the life cycle of the worker. Uh, we have not given any thought to that. We assume that just because a person gets a certificate from from an ASDC endorsed institution, whether to to fix uh, you know machines, motors, or to 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 you know become an electrician or a plumber or whatever, that that's he's going to be productive the rest of his life. And that's not going to happen in the kind of environment we work in. You can see it from automobiles. Yeah. You know, uh, automobiles that were produced 10 or 15 years ago, within a, uh, as soon as the warranty expired, you could take it to a roadside mechanic and yeah. uh, you know he'd fix it. Today you can't do that because the guy has, doesn't have the cap capability of fixing. So you know you're you're stuck to the dealer uh, for the whole life of the vehicle. Right. Uh, and that is that completely changes the costs of owning that vehicle. So. You know, we've got to start thinking along these lines. And there is a fundamental shift in in the relationship between technology, knowledge, uh, organizational structure, which is going to impact us. It's an opportunity for us. It's also a threat. Right. Uh, Subir, uh, I think that uh, uh, that's a great note to end on. I think you've pointed out that there is a, a, a clear opportunity in the way that in the fact that we've not perhaps gone the whole manufacturing way uh, and and invested so much on ground because the, the model of consumption and the model of production has changed. Perhaps this is an opportunity for us to leapfrog, uh, but to do that, 
there needs to be very very solid policy uh, uh, clarity and uh, backing and understanding and therefore execution and that of course is the big task for the government ahead uh, thank you very much subir for joining us and sharing your thoughts